I don't know how this is going to go this morning. I, I'm just going to trust God today. And I know that you trust uh, your pastor to hear from God. And, and uh, I want you to feel safe to invite people to come. They're going to hear the word. And then visitors come into the house of the Lord that here in this place. We're not only going to feel the presence of God, but we are also going to hear the word of God. And uh, too many, too often times, I believe that we go to services to feel the presence of the Lord, and there's not much words spoken. And that is uh, a Corinthian mentality, and it is not what God would have us to do. We want to praise and glorify the Lord so we can get into His presence. So then, the Word of God can mold us and can correct us. Nobody likes correction. Praise God. Me worse than anybody. I hate to be corrected. My wife knows that. But we need it. Everybody say, we need it. We need it. Praise God. Yes. It's not fun. But the Word of God can do that. And if you love the Word, then you won't mind being corrected by it. And I'm not here to correct you. I'm just saying that the Word of God is what we need. It's going to sustain us. And the Word of God is going to get us to heaven. The presence of the Holy Ghost is not going to get us there. It's the preaching of the Word of God. We are still saved. Everybody say, foolish preaching. By the foolishness of preaching. Praise God. You can go and dissect that verse. It doesn't mean foolish preaching. Praise God. But I, I want to talk to you this morning. I, I wanted you to be seated. I've got a story to read to you out of the Bible. I like Vesta Mang, and she says, you know what? Pastors, if you ever run out of something to say, just go and start reading the Bible. How about that? The Lord God would uh, put something on your heart, and you can just step to the pulpit and just start reading the Word. And you know what the Bible said? You know what? In, in Acts chapter 10... All of, the, all of Cornelius' house received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and they didn't do it while the choir was singing. They didn't. <laughs> Told us some Richards, they said, you know what, we, we like the music, and we like, but we really just want the word. I said, you know what, sick him, Jesus. That's fine. And I'm going to tell you what, a lot of times when the Spirit of the Lord begins to move, and uh, people begin to feel, uh, I'm going to tell you what, ah, praise God. While, but while Peter yet spake the word, the Holy Ghost fell upon them that heard the word. Praise God. So if you come hungry, the word of God can do miraculous things in your life. I, I want to read you a story here, and then I'm going to go in and we'll, and we'll uh, dissect it just a little bit. But in Luke chapter 24, in verse number 13, if you'll put that up there. And I'll begin reading if you have your Bible. And, and again, I, I've got this long. It's, it's, I don't want you to stand the whole time because I want you to listen. Pay attention to what, I'm, what we're talking about here. And if I can, I, I'll just bring this down to, the, to a story level. How's that? Okay, rather than just reading scriptures. But, uh, and behold, the Bible says, Two of them went the same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together all of these things which happened. Now, what is happening here is these two men are leaving after the third day of the crucifixion. And uh, they are walking there, and no doubt they are very upset and very distraught about all the happenings that just happened in their holy city. But it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned with one another, Jesus himself drew near. Everybody say, drew near. drew near. And he went with them. But their eyes were holded that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one ask, ask one? He says, Why are you guys so sad? And one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, he said, answered and said to him, Art thou only a stranger? You don't know what just happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus looked at him and says, Tell on. Tell me what happened. And he said unto them, All the things that happened, they said concerning, verse number 19, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed. Notice, he's now referring him to a prophet. Discounting. He's the master, he's, the, he's the, the one who, the Messiah. No, now these men are referring to Jesus as just, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word, and God, and all the people. And how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And they went to tell Jesus the whole story. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They put their trust in something, and they were very let down. And beside all this, 
Today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, the, and a certain woman also from our company made, uh, made us astonished when she went early to the sepulcher. And when she found, and they found not his body, and they came saying that he, that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that Jesus was now alive. And a certain of them went their way to the sepulcher and found it even it was so as the women had said that he was not there. And verse number 25, and then he said unto them, O fools, Jesus said to them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Out of ought not Christ have suffered these things to enter into the glory? And Jesus begins to expound upon them of the prophets of the Old Testament. And he walks with them and he's talking about, well, don't you remember this? And, and don't you remember what the Old Testament prophecy says? And don't you remember all, all of these things must come to pass? And, and he was trying to reason with them through. And verse number 30, and it, and it came to pass that he sat down with them at the, as they entered their journey, their journey in. And he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave to them. And at that moment, their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened our minds to the scriptures? These two men, no doubt, were followers of Christ while he was ministering to the world. They had waited longer than most there in the city. Most, I'm sure, scattered the very first day. Even the disciples went into the caves and went to the houses to hide. But these men had waited now three days, longer probably than most, waiting around to see what was going to happen, witnessing the tragedy of the crucifixion and the tragedy of his death the first day of the crucifixion must have been mass confusion. No one knowing where to go. The, 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 the clouds uh, covering the sky and the earth was turned to dark. The earthquakes, uh, the tearing of the, uh, the veil and the temple and all of these happenings on the first day. Mass confusion in the city of Jerusalem, no doubt. The second day was filled with shock and some anticipation, no doubt, of what was going to happen next. And then the day came, the dawn approached, Midnight came, the morning arose on the third day, and nothing. The men had, had, must have come to the conclusion that their life, as they had grown to know it, as followers of the Messiah, was now shattered before the very eyes. All of their dreams of the kingdom of Israel being restored and all of their dreams of the kingdom of Israel finally coming back to the fervor that it once had under the reign of Solomon and King David. All of these things are now all but just lies and shattered dreams and broken promises. They had begun their journey down the road away from God's holy city and they had walked away from the dreams and the aspirations and in their minds they maybe they said that all that we saw maybe it wasn't even real every miracle that he performed maybe it really wasn't maybe it really wasn't what we actually saw or heard with our very questioning everything every thought every word every happening maybe the power of god that we felt and that we witnessed was not true at all what we thought was the Messiah now, maybe he's just a prophet. Maybe he really didn't have the power to heal. Everything that they had known to be true, they left buried in a borrowed tomb in the holy city and began their journey. Now they did not begin their walk with the Lord of intentions of quitting or walking away. None of us do. We all begin our walk with God with much fervor, with much faith, uh, with great zeal and, and great expectation of what God's going to do next for us. But sometimes when we don't see it happen or sometimes when we are, are left away from the feeling of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of the Lord and sometimes things happen and circumstances just begin to play out in your life and, and all of a sudden we begin the road. These men were on the road to Emmaus. They were walking down the road. 
of lost dreams and broken promises because circumstances had seemed to turn against them. What is it that will take us away from everything that we know is truth? What circumstances will come against you in your life that will lead you down the road of lost dreams and broken promises? What will have to happen in your life that will cause you to question God's spoken word? Now, these men no doubt heard every word that he said. They, they were disciples of him. They were followers of Christ. They, they stayed for three days in the holy city waiting and, and still nothing. And so they decided to leave. They, they heard him say, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. They also uh, no doubt heard him say, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come to you again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. They heard every promise and every word. These men no doubt heard the very spoken word of God and they believed it at one time. But the blood and the torment and the humiliation and the cry from Golgotha was too much for them to bear. The words from Calvary's cross, it is finished, must have shattered their hearts and everything is a lie. Nothing is real. What they must have heard is, it's all over. Everything you've hoped for is lost. So my question this morning is, what circumstances will draw you away from truth? What will happen in your life that will bring you away from all the promises of the holy city down the road? of lost dreams and broken promises. What is it? What, what will take you away from the scriptures and the words and the promises that, that the Holy Ghost is for you? Because this promise is for you and for your children and to as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What, what will happen to you that will begin to question your mind even more so than before? Is Jesus' name really that important? What, what will happen to us that will begin to steal away that there is one God and His name is one? There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God who is above all and through all and in you all. What is it that's going to take you away from Deuteronomy 6 and 4? And he says, Moses, I want them to write it on their foreheads. I want them to write it on the doorpost. I want them to, I want you to tell it to them early in the morning when they rise up and they go to bed at night. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Don't ever, ever let anybody ever forget it. We've all heard it. We've all believed it at one time. We've sat and taught people the Bible study. We've sat with zeal and with fervor living for God. That's what these men were doing. Is they were living for God the entire time. They were following His promises. But when left alone, they didn't realize that living for God is different than living with God. So, circumstances what will come and draw us away from the holy city and, and uh, from the place where you experience the Lord. From the very altars that you experienced God and received His promises. The altars that you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But now because of circumstances and things that have happened to you in your life, you begin to question, did I really receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Did I really speak with tongues and magnify God? Did I really, did all of those things really happen or is it just me? Sometimes it's our job that draws us away. Maybe it's our family. Or fear maybe of losing the things of this world that you hold so dear. We've been given some promises in the Word of God. And sometimes the circumstances will interfere with our believing that they are true. But I want somebody to know this morning 
Your promise is not dead. God is not lying somewhere in a tomb somewhere any longer. The stories of, in the book and the stories from the witnesses that said He is alive and the tomb is empty, they are real and they are true. And God is not going to leave you empty. And God is not going to leave you alone. There's no grave too deep. And there's no stone too heavy to keep him from fulfilling every promise that he's ever given us. Now, I know that life can be hard and life can be cruel. It can crush the hope out of the strongest soul. Heartbreaks and disappointments and losses of personal lives and finances is one of the greatest things that will draw us away from God. A lifetime of effort can be destroyed with just one phone call. With one statement from another saint. A misunderstanding of, a, of an attitude can cause us to walk away from everything that God has promised us. How many times have I walked up to somebody and they say, what kind of preacher I say, I'm a Pentecostal. Well, I, grew up, I talked to a woman this morning on the phone. She says, I grew up Pentecostal. She says, and I want to start another church over here because people are drawing to something. She says, but, but my roots go back. I talked to another man, he just recently, he says, he said, I've been hurt. See, circumstances has drawn them away from the very place that they received the promises of God. No doubt saw the miracles. But they're, but, they're, but they're gone away. Some of you here have gone away and have come back. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But trials and troubles will come to us all. Attitudes and hurt feelings and statements made by people in leadership even. I just don't agree with what the preacher said. Well, I praise the Lord. You won't always agree with everything the preacher says. If I haven't hurt your feelings yet, that's because you hadn't been here long enough. Okay? Just wait. It's coming. And I don't mean to, and no one, no one means to. But if I'm having a bad day and you're having a bad day and, man, I'm just saying that there are circumstances of life. But here, here's what we need to have. The journey of broken promises and shattered dreams is closer than we think that it is. Every one of us I know are thinking, at least I hope so, praise God, that, hey, this will never happen to me. But it's closer than you think. We're all vulnerable. That's why in Jude 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write it into the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should what? Earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. He said, you've got to earnestly contend. You've got to fight for the faith that was once delivered unto you. It's not going to be easy. Paul, talking to the Philippian church, he told him, he says, God, I have been with you for all of these years, but it's needful that I move on, I leave. He says, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now even so much the more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with what? He said with fear and with trembling. He said because I'm not going to be there to babysit you. I'm not going to be there to wipe everything and, and wipe your mouth and all of those things and make sure that you stay clean and, and make sure that everybody stays quiet in the crib. He, I'm not going to be there. He said so it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight. We need to have the spirit of Micah. We need to have the spirit of Job. We, we need to have the spirit that if I, if I get knocked down, it's all right. Because I'm going to tell the enemy I'm going to rise up. It's not going to keep me down. If something happens to me in the church, if the preacher says something, if a saint comes up to me and says something, I'm still going to get up and I'm still going to come back and I'm not going to leave the holy city and I'm not going to leave the place of my promises. Spirit of Job, he says, all things are lost. Everything that I've got, everything that I ever had has gone away. He says, but I will continue to trust in him. 
The spirit of Joseph, he says, it doesn't matter where I am, if I'm in the pit or if I'm in the prison. It doesn't matter where I am. I'm holding on to my dreams. I'm not letting go of them. I'm not going to go down the journey and walk down the road of lost dreams and broken promises. I'm not going to forsake my God. I'm not going to forsake the Word and everything that I believed. We need to have our minds made up today. This is the truth and nothing else will even come close. A perverted gospel isn't a gospel at all. A woman said they used to call us, she says, I live old time Pentecost. They used to call us a cult. What were they telling you? They're telling you that you're different. They're telling you you're separated. You're not like the rest. Friends of mine, that's a description of God's church. He didn't say it's a cult, kind of. My definition of a cult is if you don't believe this way, then you're lost. Guess what? Let me just put it out there. If you don't believe this way, you're lost. A perverted gospel isn't a gospel. A gospel that has changed up even the slightest bit. Ask Paul. He'll tell you. He says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into grace and into another gospel, which there is not another. But he says, but there will be some who will trouble you and they will change the gospel. Pervert it. He said pervert it. That means change it. He says, though we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than what you've already been preached, let him be accursed. He's telling the Galatian church, hey, you don't need to go down that road. You need to come back. You need to come back. Huh. Maybe there's someone here today that's already began the journey down the road of deceit, down the road of defeat, down the road of the lie from the devil. Maybe you've already hearkened to the ears of somebody else that says, well, you don't have to do all of that. Besides, that preacher doesn't know what he's talking about and he hurts so-and-so's feelings and, and he hurts sister so-and-so and, and, the, and the organization's all messed up. Praise God, any man-made thing is going to be messed up. If you organize something by men, by mind, it's going to be messed up. Nobody ever claims, I pray, I don't believe that anybody ever claims that everything that we ever do is perfect. It's not perfect. It's going to be flawed. We're going to make bad decisions. We just are. Because we're flesh. I mean, I'd like to stand up here and tell you every day, well, thus saith the Lord, God told me to do this. You know, sometimes I don't know. And I ask God, God, please help me. And if I mess up, please cover it. And the organization of, first of all, any organization, but the, the organization that I hold my license in, the United Pentecostal Church, they're not perfect either. But that doesn't mean we have to walk away from everything and say, well, that's not right. Because as soon as you start walking down that road, everything becomes a question. Everything becomes a question. I'm going to tell you what most people who, say, who, want, to, who want to deviate from one point eventually will leave the name. They'll leave the name. The oneness, they'll leave it. They'll leave baptism in Jesus' name. They'll leave the, whole, the evidence of speaking in tongues as the baptism of the evidence of the... They'll leave it all, eventually. I'm telling you. Well, so-and-so hasn't. You watch him. You watch it. They will. Brother Stowe, tell me, he, he, I'm, praise God. Well, we don't have standards at our church. Yeah, you do. You do have standards. Everybody has standards. There's a person that came in the church and said, well, I go to the church of the Freedom Church. We kind of do what we want to do. Oh, so you, the preacher lets you go out there and wear whatever or, or maybe nothing? Yeah. Oh, no, well, we wouldn't be able to do that. Well, then, there's a standard. Just where we draw our line is different than where you draw your line. Praise God. I'm just saying that there is a and we're going to go over this maybe tonight. God's been dealing with me on that Timothy the scriptures that we've been that we talked about last Sunday night. But the babblings and the the, the profanity that took away Hymenaeus and his buddy I forget his name from the church, and he's warning Timothy about that. It began with the babbling. 
and profanity. It just started out with a small thing. And it began to compromise the resurrection and the, and the details of the gospel. And once they did that, they lost it all. And they, and they went out of the church. But I want to say that someone here may be in your life. Your circumstances or whatever has happened to you, the decisions that you've made, has, have made you begin to question the promises or question the truth. The truth that you said at one time, this is, I have found truth. You see what happens. There's a warning to, to, to this morning. What happens to you when you begin this journey is you get so clouded in your mind that you do not hear the voices of those who you trusted in the past. These men were told that the promises were no longer lying in the tomb. These men heard the story that his resurrection had taken place. They heard the story from the women and from the men. They all confirmed it. The grave is empty. The angels have declared that he is risen. But somehow, because they entered into the road of broken promises and lost dreams, and they started down that journey, their minds were clouded, and they couldn't hear the people who they trusted in the past. But they, like so many others, had already began the journey away from the holy city. They had already turned their backs on everything that they knew was truth. And they turned their minds and they became so clouded they lost the ability to even listen to the saints of God. Bidding them, come back. Come back. I know we're not perfect. I know it's not perfect. I know it's not what you expected. I know that you didn't expect him to go down into the ground and, and to be crucified. I know you didn't expect these bad things to happen, but, but come back. Come back. The saints who you've worshipped with, the saints who you've laid in the altars with, the saints who you've broken bread with, those who you know are in tune with God, somehow all of a sudden no longer have the impact on your life. Why is that? Because you've already started the journey. But God sent me here this morning to tell you the rest of the story. You see, the road of lost dreams and broken promises, it's like any other road. The road to Emmaus begins at Jerusalem, and it ends at Emmaus. It has a beginning. It has an ending. Every road is the same. This road of loneliness and this road of brokenness is only a few short miles, and then there is an Emmaus. You see, Jerusalem for us today is the church. It is the promises of God spoken to you while you were yet in the fold and you were yet in his flock. And Emmaus is the place where you realize, finally, that you have been in a spiritual darkness and have journeyed away from the zeal that you once had and away from a relationship that you once had with God and maybe a relationship that you had with Jesus Christ that's been so long ago that you can hardly even remember what it's like to be in his presence. Emmaus is also a place where you realize that the promises and the dreams that you left buried in a tomb back at the church actually never left you. That who you thought was a stranger's voice was actually the Lord walking with you every step of the way. See, His promise to them, even though they turned their backs on the promises that He gave them, His promise was, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even if you forsake me, I will be with you every hour of every day. You will never leave, I will never leave you for saying, not even the grave could keep him from you. All the while you were taking this journey, all the while you were walking on this road, he was there with you in the stillness of the night. 
And if you're on that journey this morning, you know what I'm talking about. When all the day has settled and the hour is late and you lay down in your bed and your mind has nothing else to do, God will remind you of the scriptures. He will bring back into remembrance of your mind the things that you once said and the things that you once felt and your tears will well up. I know I've talked to people who have come to Emmaus and they've come through and they say, hey, Pastor, I'm going to tell you what, the loneliest and the hardest time of walking in that journey is when I lay down at night and I can feel the burning inside because that's God with you. And he's there with you and he's speaking to you. And he's not revealing himself to you. He's just being a gentleman. And he's just saying, remember this. Remember that. Remember the moment when I first touched you. Remember the moment when I first filled you with my spirit. Remember the moment when I healed you. Remember the moment when this happened. Remember, and all the wild tears begin to well up and you think, I've got to get back to the house of God. But I've left so much. I've, I've already turned away. God would never receive me back. I would never be able to go back to the place. Emmaus is the end of the road. It's the end of the spiritual darkness. It's the end of the journey. Emmaus is the place where your eyes all of a sudden become opened and you realize that God never left you and that there is a place for you still with Him. And that He didn't condemn those men the whole time that they just told him all the bad and everything that had happened that was awful. And he was just continued to say, but what about this? But what about what Moses said? But what about this? And they looked at one another when they realized, these two men realized that they had departed and they had left everything. And they looked at him and neither one of them, neither one of these men says, oh, I wonder if we'll ever get back. I wonder if we'll ever be able to get back into the graces. No, all they said was, did you feel the burning that I felt? Did you feel the burning? That when we heard the words, it was just like that we were with him that same day that we were in the holy city. Remember the day that we leaned against his bosom in the Judean hills and we heard him expound on the parables and how it burned inside of our hearts. And when we were walking by the way, do you remember how it felt? What it was like to feel pure. What it was like to feel clean. What it was like to feel a clean before God in the presence of His glory. So I came to tell you this morning. The promises of the Lord are not buried in a tomb. They are just as real as the day that He spoke them to you. And they are just as real. And if circumstances come into your life, don't walk down the road. Stay there in the city and wait for the resurrection of the promises because they're coming. Don't let hurt feelings or, 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 or a bad experience. I don't know how much worse it can get to see your master crucified and humiliated and spit on before everybody. But even if anything that, as bad as that could happen, stay, trust in God. And if you've already walked away, stand with me. If you've already walked away from the city and you're on the road of lost dreams and broken promises, I came here this morning to tell you that your journey can end today. Your road began somewhere, but it can end today. How long have you journeyed? How long has your road been? How far away from God have you traveled? And you might think, I've traveled too far. I've traveled too far. I can never go back. But you understand how a road is. A road has a beginning and it has an ending. And the farther away you get from from the promise, the closer you are to Emmaus, 
The closer you are to when God will reveal to you that I've been with you and I'm not going to leave you and I'm going to restore you and everything's going to be all right. The Bible says that Emmaus from Jerusalem was about three score furlongs. So all you Bible scholars can figure out how far that is. But I'm going to tell you how far it is tonight, this morning. The distance between Jerusalem and Emmaus. The distance between your buried promises and the realization that they have risen and that you are accepted is as far away from where you are to the altar today. That's how far it is. Close your eyes this morning. Bow your heads today. Father, we love you, Jesus. Father, we give you praise and we glorify your name. Go ahead, sister. Father, in your name this morning, God, I pray that you would touch my heart, that you would speak to me, Lord, as I have journeyed on this road, God, today. I pray that you would meet me at the altar, that you would break bread with me once more, that you would take me back, God, 